Okay, hello and welcome to another edition of Sporting Heritage in Conversation. Uh, Sporting Heritage are working on a number of different programmes connected to the Women's Euros this summer 2022 and we are thrilled to be involved. One of the programmes is to support the delivery of the Heritage Programme funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund for the host city Sheffield and this in conversation is part of that activity. So I'm Justine Riley and today I'm in conversation with Ruth Johnson from Football Unites Racism Divides also known as FIRD. Hi Ruth! Hello. <laughs> and also I'm joined by Verity Smith, who is one of our amazing Sport and Heritage Associates working on the programme. Hi, Verity. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so we're going to have a relaxed chat about what's coming up in terms of the programme in Sheffield, but also find out a little bit more about what FUR does, um, how it's um, involved in the city of Sheffield and um, just hearing more about the impact of the work that you do, Ruth. Um, so first, we'd really like to hear a little bit more about what FIRD does and if you could give a little bit of background about about the organisation and its impact. Um, so FIRD, as you said, stands for Football Unites Racism Divides. Um, we're a registered charity, um, we're a youth and social inclusion project um, using football as a tool to um, bring people together from different backgrounds and um, hopefully by bringing people together we will um, break down lots of barriers that are caused by ignorance in many cases and educate people um, just to informally get to know each other um, and yeah use it using football as a tool to in increase participation um, of underrepresented groups in football and therefore in wider society as well um, so we concentrate mainly on football but we also have um, things like young um, youth work programs um, so at the moment we've got one um, which is working with young people on a, um, a program to um, educate other young people about the dangers of knife crime and gun crime and things like that and we have employability programs as well so um, we can work kind of quite intensively with with people who are struggling to access the job market or whatever need some really sort of tailored support that's um you know individual to to them whether it's help with their cv or um mm -hmm. voluntary work to get involved in um subsidized training courses things like that um so yeah we would well, we i mean it's a massive amount of work that you're doing how how long has first been in existence Ruth? um since about 1996 um so it's grown, grown quite a bit over the years. Um, yeah, it was set up by a group of Sheffield United supporters and youth workers and con concerned members of the community locally around um, the Sheffield United ground, really. That's kind of the part of Sheffield where we're based. Um, there have been a few nasty incidents, um, I think, on, on match days um, of the, the young BME population being assaulted um, and abused and things um, by football fans. Um, so it grew out of that really, um, as, as uh, yeah, people were concerned about like, how um, the club could be seen as a, a positive part of the community and a, a welcoming part of the com community. Um, but yeah, it's, it's grown from being just a local project to being sort of had international campaigns and in some international work as well over the years. When it got going, did that have um, a bit more prominence due to Euros 96 being hosted in this country? Was Did that help to kind of give it a bit more of a platform to kind of pos a positive message? Um, I think it was just after that, really, that oh, okay. uh, so, really got yeah. going. But I think that, yeah. might, that might have been one of the impetuses, if that's a word behind. Yeah, yeah, kind of gave it momentum, I suppose. It, momentum, thank you. That's yeah. <laughs> Oh, blimey. I mean, in terms of the impact then of what FIRD's doing and has done, that seems like it's making some significant difference in Sheffield alone. Is that something that's being measured and is recognised and maybe being used as a model? Uh, measuring it is difficult. Um, is it? Um, it has. It has been used as a model, certainly. Yeah, and it, I think it is. It's um, recognised in some in some quarters in Sheffield. Certainly, I think. I think locally is probably where we can see the biggest impact because we we can see the difference in sort of individual young people that have worked with over the years, for example. 
um, um, yeah, measuring something like, um, let's say, the, the number of racist incidents uh, and whether we're having any impact on that is, is quite difficult. It's just difficult to prove it, really. Um, we did try at one point um, and we convinced ourselves that we <laughs> that we were making a difference in our local area. The great number of racist incidents did go down. Um, uh, but kind of proving that link is, is not very easy. And obviously race, racism seems to have got worse again over the, the last few years, which mm. is really depressing. Um, we yeah. can't control everything that's happening out in the, the wider world that, that affects that kind of thing. Is that kind of work expanded across South Yorkshire? I mean, do you work kind of beyond the immediate boundary of Sheffield or is it very kind of concentrated on um, the Sheffield postcode, if you like? Uh, we have we have um, worked in other parts of South Yorkshire, certainly of, over the years. Um, I think less less so at the moment. Um, although obviously with more and more stuff being online, it's, um, you don't have to just... Um, it's more accessible, I suppose, isn't it? Barry around the edge of Sheffield. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a funding as well, isn't it? And being able to access the right amount of investment um, to support. Yeah, it. absolutely. And um, a lot of our work's been on kind of short term funding, like mm -hmm. project work. So we might have done a project for a couple of years that involved working in Barnsley or Doncaster or somewhere. And then that's finished and we've had to try and find some more funding to do something else. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, one of the challenges really of working this sort of organisation. I mean, we've been watching your work for quite a while now and it is phenomenal to see what's happening and what you do. Um, and the Good to know, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's watching, right? It's amazing to see it. And, you know, you can just see the impact that that has the potential to make even wider. And the work that you're doing with the women's Sheffield, um, the women's Euros in Sheffield, I'm intrigued to hear more about how that's working and maybe what you've found out so far um, and what we can hope to see coming up really if you're able to tell us a bit more about that that'd be amazing <laughs> um so myself and a, a couple of friends had had this idea a couple of years ago now about um doing a, a project um around the like the history of women in women's football in sheffield um doing some research into the history and then using that as a way of um, inspiring creative outputs. So we had ambitious ideas about John plays and various things. Um, this was before we knew that there was going to be a heritage lottery project doing, <laughs> doing much the same thing. <laughs> we thought it was just us at that time. Um, we wanted to tie it in with the Euros at, at that time. They were due to be in 2021. And that was um, also the San the centenary of the year that the FA banned women from playing football on their affiliated pitches. So that seemed like a really good time to to, uh, to start doing that, that project. Um, so, yeah, um, we're not doing everything that we thought we might do. <laughs> Realise we've been really over ambitious, but uh, the Heritage Lottery projects come along as well. And it turns out some of those things or similar things are hopefully going to happen anyway. Um, I've been concentrating mainly on researching the, the history, local history of women in football um, and doing a few interviews um, with women involved, um, past and present. Um, and what are you um, finding, Ray? <clears throat> uh, well, um, Sheffield, Sheffield Football Club, um, uh, claims it's the oldest football club in the world um, and, and we have found that right back in 1859 I think they, they had at least one female member by the early 1860s they yeah, had over 20 mm -hmm. women members um, I haven't found out yet what they did why they were members or who they were mm -hmm. it's quite elusive at the moment but um, that, that just show that there were women involved in football yeah. Yeah, that's amazing to kind of find that thread to be able to begin that research in a bit more depth. There's also um, an, an old photo that appeared in a, a newspaper in, I think it was about 1875, 
of um, what we think is a representative Sheffield football team. Um, and there are two mysterious women in that photo. They're not dressed in football kit, dressed in hats and coats and things, I think. Um, all the men are named in the caption, but, but not women the aren't. <laughs> <laughs> Again, there's evidence that women were in and around football way yeah. back. Um, we don't we don't know who they were or why they were on the picture. So, so there's some interesting little mysteries there that we haven't really. <laughs> quite yeah, definitely. So the that's conversations. The Sorry, go on, me. <laughs> that's a couple of couple of the earliest examples. And I think the earliest women's match we found out about so far in Sheffield was in 1881. Between wow. two two uh, touring teams that were touring the country at the time, um, charging people to, to go and watch. So they oh, could be so considered to be professional players. But. Yeah. So you're charting that that shift of women's football and the progression. And are you when you're talking to the women and in interviewing footballers, are you hearing the stories about the difficulties of what was experienced as well in terms of that progression? We are, yeah. Um, I mean, there's one one woman we interviewed um, called Michelle, who's uh, in her fifties. She didn't play her first eleven aside football match till she was fifty three. That's how long it, it took, even though she was playing football since she was a little kid. Um, there were so few opportunities, but she kept going, kept going. In the last few years, as, as <clears throat> women's football has, has developed quite a lot and more kind of informal opportunities like like the ones that we run at third um have, have yeah. started to to spring up then that's that's given her a, a springboard to um to go from five aside kickabouts to joining an 11 side team mm. um wow. uh, yeah there's, <laughs> there's things like that we've also found some people haven't experienced as many barriers as we might have thought particularly the younger players and that's that's really encouraging as well shows that things are changing um yeah. so yeah it's a mixture really some younger players are still experiencing barriers and, and some aren't um but yeah it's it's interesting to chart that kind of change over time so we're making progress but there's still there's still uh, a way to go yet i think have you uncovered stories from that especially from that period um when women were banned from playing football by the fa if you have you, have you found kind of women's experiences or, um, during that time or is it is is there very much a gap between before 1921 if that's right and um, and you know in the, in the last few decades where it, where it took off again uh, there is a, a really big gap yeah um, it's much harder to find stories in that time period obviously yeah, yeah. sure finally people who are still around to, to tell tell those stories is absolutely yeah yeah that's one of the things that's quite tricky isn't it, on, the, on the project yeah um so i'm seeing somebody later today actually was in the, the 70s to to interview her um about how she um got in the national newspapers for playing for a boys team i think when she was 10. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's uh, yeah some something I saw in the newspaper archives. Um, I think from the 1950s, was a, a a woman wrote in to say why hasn't Sheffield got a women's football? <gasps> I'd like to start one, um, but did she? I, I have yet to find any evidence that that she did. Um, even though there were some women's teams around at that period, uh, there was one in Doncaster, I believe, at that time. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, some women were still playing, um, but yeah, very sporadically I think. And uh, there's a few charity matches I think played in the 1930s, particularly uh, to raise money for local hospitals, things like that. Um, I think they might just have been like one-offs, but again, oh, proved wrong yet um, <laughs> this is i mean it's fascinating research isn't it because often women's history generally has been kind of ignored inside like when you add sport into it that's often again something that hasn't been at the forefront of historical studies so to be able to go back and start looking at that and what are the gaps it's both 
heartening to hear some of the stories and just so yeah demoralizing isn't it to understand just how much of a difficulty that was for women um and what an impact that had and you're seeing that in that replication in sheffield alone of what was happening more na you know, nationally yeah crikey i mean i'm so interested to hear more about your research as it develops and one of my questions was you know what next what next for your work on the project and then what next for third what are you doing in terms of the wider work um on the project well um i have to find some way of writing all the research up and make it accessible <laughs> to people so hopefully some of that will, will go on the third website um on the project page on there soon and um working on some exhibitions that will be in Sheffield City Centre during the Euros. Uh, so there's going to be some outdoor monoliths around Sheffield City Centre. Some of them are uh, uh, designed nationally to tell us the kind of national history of women's football. Um, but we've got a couple that we can we can customise to the, the local story. Uh, so I need to get cracking on that. Um, there's going to be more exhibitions in the Winter Gardens. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so hopefully that that have some more kind of interactive stuff, and some fun stuff uh, in there. So, um, and uh, yeah, hopefully do some more interviews, and we'll be working with you guys. Hopefully to get more stories out there. Yeah, I know that we sort various of other partners with as well. speaking to some former players, and I was just going to ask in more in a more general sense: Are you in touch with kind of recent former players that have you know played? both for Sheffield um, and nationally, sort of, you know, at the very top of the game? Um, working on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, higher, higher up they play, the harder it is to get in touch it with them. To get hold of them, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're working on it. Um, yeah, we do have some contacts locally. That's great. Oh, I mean, it is brilliant, because then the more stories that we can get out there, the more people can see themselves reflected, can't they? In the collections and in the fact that this is what women are doing and the part that they have to play and have played in the development of football um it's, it's so important what you're doing um um yeah i'm really interested to hear more and um thank you so much for joining us today and for chatting through what you're doing and we might do another one later if, yeah. <laughs> if you can bear it thank <laughs> you so much. yeah no absolutely <laughs> fascinating research so thank you for your time Thanks so much, Ruth. Um, there'll be more in conversations coming up on Sporting Heritage. Um, and now it's time for me to stop recording. <laughs>